Sister Joan Bounds. So, uh, and then we had some other elections um, uh, that uh, we are so grateful to be a part of the United Pentecostal Church, the West Virginia District, and uh, or the Western West Virginia Western Maryland District. I don't know if I ever get used to that. Matthew chapter 16, <clears throat> be inviting people to our revival starting Friday evening at 7 o'clock, Saturday evening at 7 o'clock, and then Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. If you are unable to be here on Friday or Saturday evening, please go into the Facebook page of the church and you can join us live stream, uh, for we will be live streaming both of those services, all three services actually. Uh, but we're looking forward to a good move of the Holy Ghost. I spoke with Brother Corsi just this past week, and he's excited about it. We're excited about it, and uh, I believe God's excited about it. Amen. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13 through verse number 19, the Bible says, And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus pointed his questioning directly to his disciples. He saith unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Turning to the book of Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> the birth of the New, New Testament church. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse number 42. This was after Pentecost. This was after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the outside of the upper room. Uh, the Bible says, and they continued, everybody say continued. continued. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. I believe today that I've heard from the Lord, and I believe that we need get, to get busy building his church. Yes. Hallelujah. We have a responsibility to build the church of Jesus Christ. Can we lift our hands one more time and love the Lord Jesus? We love you with all of our hearts. So thankful today for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come to the house of God today. I thank you for your saints' faithfulness, Lord. God, we're so thankful for the Holy Ghost that we have felt in the place today. Thank you, Lord, for the worship of your people. God, we're so grateful today for your word. We're so thankful today that you've imparted to us truth. God, we ask the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be upon our ears that we might hear the word of God. Lord, let it rest upon our hearts that we might hear and not just hear the word, but respond to the word of God today. Lord, anoint your servant this morning that I might speak the word as you've given it to me. God, we worship and adore you today. So thankful that we're a part of the church of Jesus Christ. So thankful today that we're a part of this glorious church, this bride of Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I know uh, from past experience the importance of having a material list when you start to build something. Anybody ever start a project to find out you didn't have enough stuff to fix 
what you was fixing. There's times where I'm at work, people will come in, and, and I can't tell you how many times people have walked into the store where I work and, and says, I need a certain size screw or a certain size bolt. I was putting something together, and uh, it's missing some of the pieces. Hallelujah. I've sold a lot of material that way to walk-in customers uh, that have started a project and find out that the material list was incomplete. Several years ago, my wife and I purchased a set of blueprints for a house, and, and along with the blueprints, it brought a, or I, we received a material list, and it was, it was very meticulous. It talked about how many two-by-fours you would need, how many eight-footers, and how many ten-footers, and, and uh, how many two-by-sixes, and how many two-by-eights, and two-by-twelves, and, and, and how many pieces of plywood, and how many square of siding, and, 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 and on down through the list. It even went down to be as meticulous as telling you how many pounds of sinker nails that you needed and how many pounds of drywall nails would you would need or how many pounds of finished nails. Everything that was needed to build that constru- or to construct the house that we purchased the blueprint for uh, was on that material list. They thought of everything and it was a pretty inclusive list and, and it was quite long to say the least but the, the advantage of having the material list list is one of two things, one of, or two things rather. One of them is you understand what you're getting into. Another thing, you can take it to a lumber store or a lumber yard and they can take that list and they can price each line item and tell you exactly what the material list is going to call or, or cost to build the building or the house or the barn or the pole building that you're building. Hallelujah. Amen. The material list shows you all the material that's used in the construction of a building. Uh, Blueprints shows you where everything on that material list goes. Tells you where the two by four by eights go and where the two by four by ten goes and where the two by twelve by twelve goes and, and and where to use all of the material that's on the list. So it's necessary not just to have a material list, but it's also important to have a blueprint. And and it's certainly good to have a blueprint, but what makes the blueprint go a lot better is to have a material list. And what I'm saying is simply we need both of them. We need one uh, and the other. We don't need one with Without the other. It's been so long since some people have followed enclosed instructions. Hallelujah. Hell, anybody ever buy? Just recently we bought a, uh, a file cabinet that had to be put together. It wasn't one of the metal file cabinets. It was not wood, but it looked like wood, and it had to put it together. And, and, and there's, a lot of, it, there's a lot of men that have trouble. And, and matter of fact, men are notorious about not following instructions. It doesn't matter if the table calls for four legs. If we get it together and it only has three on, we are happy because we could do it without an instruction list. We didn't have to follow directions. And it's been so long since some people have followed the enclosed instructions that we don't know how to follow instructions. Hallelujah. Can all the married ladies shout out amen. Hallelujah. We just don't like to follow instructions. We don't want to stop and get directions when we're on a trip. We know where we're going. We're just taking the scenic route. Hallelujah. But before you ladies start running the aisles this morning, how often have you pre-tasted your food that you're cooking to realize by the taste that something is missing? And then you tell your husband, you give your husband that loaded question. Taste this and tell me if it's good or not. Hallelujah. What man among us have not said, tastes just fine to me. Hallelujah. The reason that it doesn't taste the same is because you've prepared the meal for so long that you find it no longer necessary to use the recipe. I know how much of this to put in it. I know how much of a dash to put in this. And I I don't have to follow the instructions. Are you following me today? Amen. We are so out of touch with following instructions that we no longer know how to follow instructions. That's why, brethren, we sit down and we start reading the instructions on constructing something and we think, what did that just tell me to do? 
We have not followed instructions. Hallelujah. Amen. The reason sometimes that the thing that you're chili that you're making don't taste like it did before is because you didn't do what you did the last time. Something is missing. Now, I understand today some of you are more schooled in the art of cooking than I am. I don't cook. I can cook, but I don't cook. Hallelujah. Cooking, though, in general, is something that doesn't come natural. Well, Brother Hopkins, I just started cooking and, and didn't need anything. Like I just was an accomplished cook as soon as I got. Any of you ladies, were y'all an accomplished cook when you, start, when you got married? Some of y'all, y'all, some of y'all's mothers sat down and showed you how to cook and how to fix things and, and this and that. And, and, and if you're like me, my dad taught me how to work on houses. He taught me how to work on cars. And though he taught me and though I was there, I wasn't in the classroom. Hallelujah. My mind was on a ball field somewhere or on a basketball court or doing something else. I was fishing. I was hunting in my mind. I was listening, but I wasn't paying attention. Hallelujah. But cooking doesn't come natural because if cooking came natural, there would not be any need for instructions on the side of the box of the cake mix. Be no necessary. You wouldn't have to have all of those cookbooks that you've collected over time and people has bought you for gifts and, and you have in your kitchen. You wouldn't have to have a cookbook because it would come natural. There would be no need for you to share recipes among your family and your friends. I've, I've heard my wife be asked before when she's fixed something and, and we've had guests over, can you send me the recipe or how do you make that? And and we've passed recipes from generation to generation. There are some, though, that have followed directions, and sometimes the cake still don't turn out right. Hallelujah. Sometimes that four-legged table still ends up with three legs. Hallelujah. But cooking is defined or building is defined in the most simplest terms as when you put a bunch of things together, some of which by themselves, as far as cooking, doesn't taste good, and you mix them all together, and you, when you're finished, the finished product is a tasty dish or a delicious meal. Brethren, you might scratch your head about where that screw goes or where that bolt goes, but I promise you it's not intended to have leftover parts when you're working on something. I've yet to work on a vehicle. I've taken engines apart. I've put them back together. I've rebuilt motors. And without fail, I always have a bolt or two left over. There was an intended purpose for that bolt originally, but there's a lot of things that I've put back together that, that I've got a collection of bolts at the house that I should never have to buy another bolt in my lifetime. But during the ministry of Jesus, he began mixing together some ingredients, some materials that would become what we call the New Testament church. He chose fishermen. He chose tent makers. He chose a tax collector. He chose a doctor and, and he even chose somebody that was, uh, that was a Judas that was going to betray him. Amen. He chose men who came from different backgrounds and, and different social fears and, and men who had personalities that would clash and men who had faults and men that had failures in their lives and men that were not perfect. And he chose these men and, and he put Put them all together and, and, and sometimes if I can say this, I don't believe they always got along. Matter of fact, you can read in the scripture where there were squabbles amongst the disciples. But he put all of these people together. He didn't pick perfect men. He didn't pick perfect women. And I'm so glad today he still doesn't choose perfect men and perfect women because I would be left out. 
Hallelujah. Some of these men that he chose were carnal. Some seemed to be a little bit more spiritual than the others. Some were patient and some were not so much patient. Some were in professions that were desired. Luke was a physician. That's certainly a desired position or a profession. He meant since some people or some that he chose were disliked and even hated for their jobs, he chose Matthew, which was a tax collector. He meant and we understand this time of year that tax collectors is not on the top of the list of most liked people. But he chose not just a doctor, not just fishermen, not just tax collectors, but he chose them all. And, and he chose those that would even be considered undesirable by most that were in the religious and even social circles of that day. Some would step back and look and see the background of these men and wonder in their hearts and in their minds, what was the master thinking? They certainly would not be our first choice. But he took all of these men and all of the people that was involved with making the church of Jesus Christ and he touched them. And with the touch of the master's hand, these men would become the ones that would turn their world upside down for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The least likely ministry, the least likely of all ministers seemed to be the ones that you would think uh, that would not be able to accomplish much, but, but certainly the songwriter wrote the words, little is much when God is in it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Not only did these men impact their generation, but they're still impacting generations since then. They are impacting our generation. Hallelujah. Because we are judged by what the early church accomplished. We talk about wanting to be a church like it was on the day of Pentecost. Hey Amen. We go back, every preacher that preaches is judged by the ministry of the Apostle Paul and Peter and James and John and Mark and Matthew. Every church is judged by the miracle ministry of the church in the New Testament church. Every service is graded by what happened then. I remember when the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was upon us. Amen. Can you hear me this morning? Amen. We judge ourselves, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, we judge ourselves by the early church, and certainly it is our blueprint for the church of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt that this New Testament church was a revival church. It was a church that impacted their neighborhood. It was a church that impacted their friends. It was a church that impacted their communities and their, their country. Amen. It turned the world upside down. Uh, people were getting the Holy Ghost at an unprecedented pace. And, and, and we sit here this morning over 2,000 years later, and I'm here to tell somebody today that if Jesus Christ did it then, Jesus wants to do it today. I believe that God desires for the church to have revival. I believe that Jesus desires the church to be patting babies on the back. I believe Jesus does not desires the church to be baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ and people to be receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, can you agree with me this morning? God desires to have a revival church in the day and hour that we're living. Don't you suppose the world is getting as bad as it is uh, so that the church can move out of its comfort zone and start reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. The church of today is bigger than the church back then. The church of today is stronger than it was then. The church of today is more talented than it was then. Amen, the church today has more resources than the church our fathers that, that our fathers had uh, still having all the resources and the knowledge of how to have revival we, yet, we have yet to scratch the surface in the revival that Jesus wants us to have. But we console ourselves. <clears throat> we console ourselves by saying, well, when it's God's time, we'll have revival. Hallelujah. I challenge that thought this morning by asking you, when is it not God's time to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost? 
The Bible says in our scripture text, he added to the church daily such as should be saved. We challenge ourselves, or we don't challenge ourselves. We console ourselves by saying, when is it, when, when it's God's time. Amen. When is it not God's time to pull someone from the dregs of sin? When is it not God's time to loose them from the chains of addiction and fill them with the Holy Ghost? It doesn't matter to God what time of day it is. It doesn't matter to him whether it's a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening Bible study. It doesn't matter to him if it's a Monday night or a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or a Sunday. It doesn't matter to God whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon, at nighttime or at midnight. God God can fill people and God desires to fill people with the Holy Ghost. It doesn't matter to God if the preacher is young or if the preacher is old. It doesn't matter to God if he is out of touch with this current generation or if he's hip with the generation that we're in. It doesn't matter to God. What matters is when a hungry heart and the presence of the Lord shows up in the same place at the same time and there will be an outpouring pouring of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. God is waiting on the church. Say ye not there are yet four months and then come of the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields for they are white already to harvest. God has done his part. He's planted the seed and the seed's grown and he's watered it and he has called sun to shine upon it. And now the harvest is ready, church. And we're waiting on God. And while we're waiting on God, God is waiting on the church. He's already prepared the harvest fields. The scripture continues to say, pray that the harvest or that there would be labors to go into the field. But we unqualify ourselves from a move of God. I was thinking about the spies that went into Jericho to the promised land. and Sometimes we are, eh, we are guilty of looking down our, our long noses at the two spies that came back with a negative report. When Israel was just across the river from their land of promise, they came back with a negative report. I wonder, and as I was thinking about the spies, I thought to myself, Lord, how many times have you brought us to the banks of the river with a revival close enough to touch it. And then we talk ourselves out of getting our feet wet. Hello. You might feel that the church is made up of a downtrodden group of used-to-be's, misfits if you please. But if you look and study the scripture, those are exact exactly the ones that Jesus used to build his church. Amen. Those that nobody wanted anything. Fishermen back in those days was just as bad as being a shepherd. Shepherds and, sh and fishermen were, were the bottom of the barrel as far as professions. They stank. Both of them stank because of their profession. Hallelujah. I don't know if anybody have ever been around sheep, but sheep stink. Hallelujah. I always told me about bear, bear, stink. It wasn't until I was able to shoot a bear that I realized that what they were telling me was true. They really do stink. Coyotes stink. Hello. Amen. Shepherds had a smell about them. Fishermen had a smell about them. Hey man, can I just throw this in for good measure? When you are a fisher of men, you're going to have an aroma about you. Hey man, that's going to make other people uncomfortable because they're not fishermen. But fishermen that smell like fish 
doesn't mind to be around fishermen that smell like fish. Are you hearing me this morning? Soul winners that are about the business of winning souls uh, may have an aroma about them, uh, but they're going to be associated with people that have the aroma of winning souls. Uh, God, give me the smell of fish today. I want to be a fisher of men. Uh, I I don't want to be a pleaser of men. Uh, I want to be a fisher of men. And there's a lot of fish out there in the lake uh, in order for, we got churches today fighting over the same fish. Oh, I could go on a tangent there, but I refrain. There's plenty of fish in the water. Our position in these last days is not the position that we're just going to be hanging on, preacher. I just got to make it through the, uh, we're going we're, we're to just barely make it to the church by the, by the hair of my chin. I'm going to make it to heaven, and I, I got to do everything I can. I promise you today, if you are so concerned about losing the Holy Ghost, there's probably a reason why you're so concerned. But when you're about your father's business, you're not going to be worried about losing your salvation. Can you hear me today? Is there anybody in the house that believes what I'm preaching this morning. Jesus himself said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. We need to pick up the pace. We need to tell somebody about the life changing. Amen. We need to tell somebody about the soul saving, the devil chasing power of the name of Jesus Christ. If there's ever been a time when our world needs revival, if there's ever been a time when we need to build the church of Jesus Christ, it's the day and hour Are you listening to me this morning? Today is the day of salvation. We spend most of our time complaining on the things that we don't have instead of using what we do have. All you need is a hungry heart and the death, burial, and resurrection gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all you need for somebody to get the Holy Ghost. You don't have to have nice seats. You don't have to have carpet floors. You don't have to have air conditioning. You don't have to have a PA system. You don't have to have a keyboard or drums or bass guitar. Amen. You don't even have to have lights. All you got to do is to find somebody that's hungry. Everybody ought to wake up of a morning and say, Lord, put me in the path of somebody that is hungry. Has, how long has it been since you prayed that prayer? Amen. God, if I'm down at the store and I walk upon somebody and they're hungry, let's something be said that I can strike up a conversation and tell them about the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. Oh, are you hearing me this morning? Amen. There's hungry people out there. I refuse to believe otherwise today. There are hungry people out there that are waiting for somebody to be sensitive enough. We don't need all of the things that we think we need to have revival. Amen. Revival is not predicated upon where you live. Preacher, we just live in a rural community. Amen. But the Bible says that Philip had revival in a desert land. Amen. It's not dependent upon your talents. God called Moses to deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt. And Moses had a speech impediment. Amen. We, it doesn't matter of the building that you worship in. The the tabernacle in the wilderness and Solomon's temple. Amen. The the temple in the, or the tabernacle in the wilderness was made out of skins of animals, but that didn't stop the Shekinah glory of God from showing up. Matter of fact, Pentecost had happened in a rented room. All of the things that we think are necessary are really not necessary. We really don't have to reinvent the wheel. It took, uh, uh, Brother Rick said something about it this morning. We, revive was going to come the way it did back then. I am fully convinced of that. We don't have to modernize revival. If it took prayer, fasting, and anointed preaching back then, it's going to take the same today. The Bible slipped the scripture in that we read today and they found favor with God and with man. Hallelujah. Amen. It is the friends that you make is the ones that's going to be the ones that you win for the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I ain't got any friends, Brother Hopkins. That's why you're not winning nobody. Go out and be friendly. The Bible says if you want to have friends, show yourself friendly. 
Make people want to be your friend. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm preaching to myself sometimes. I've told my wife, I don't care what people think of me. Hallelujah. But yet I got to. I got to. Hallelujah. It took prayer and fasting. It's not going to happen by programs. Programs are good. It's not going to happen by church outings. And certainly I enjoy getting together with God's people. Man, it's not going to happen through concerts or any other extracurricular activities that we involve ourselves in. Amen. It's going to take revival praying. Amen. Revival fasting and revival preaching in order to see a move of the Holy Ghost. We find ourselves sometimes in competition to see who can have the best programs so that our church will be more attractive for the sinner to attend. I want to be careful how this next statement comes out. And I want you to listen very closely to what I'm going to say say, but what we really need to do is we need to start a fire. Hallelujah. Brother Hopkins, today is not a good day to start a fire. You're supposed to have strong wind. Well, the fire I'm talking about, when it starts, I want to see a strong wind. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, there was a sound of what? A mighty rushing wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And then what happened? The Bible says, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a what? Like as a fire. When you get the fire and when you get the wind, you get the noise. The Bible says when it was noised abroad, amen, there had gathered around the upper room men and women from 15 different countries. And they said, men and brethren, what must we do? Uh, there's nothing that attracts a crowd like a fire attracts a crowd. Uh, it was a cloven tongues like as a fire and it was the mighty rushing wind that was noised abroad that brought the crowd. Amen. The, or the disciple says did not our hearts burn within us. Even the Old Testament Jeremiah prophet said I feel it's like a fire shut up in my bones. We need to start an apostolic Holy Ghost fire that will spread throughout the hollers and the ridges of this county in this community. Amen. We can see revival. We can see a move of the Holy Ghost. The old course needs to become our anthem. The old course simply says, I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire. Hallelujah. I believe the first ingredient that we need to have, the first list on the material list, needs to be we need to be consumed with the church concept. Hallelujah. The Bible says, and they continued, everybody say continued. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And then he says, and they continuing, everybody say continuing, daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. If we're ever going to see revival, church cannot become a take it or leave it proposition. I've never seen the day, amen, when so many people feel so indifferent about church. Amen. The church has to be the center of everything that we are, everything that we do. It must define who we are. I want to be known as the church of Jesus Christ. I've told several of my employee, employers that I have worked for, I said, this is what I do, but the church is who I am. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Got to have a church concept. It's all about the church. Your job's not going to save you. Your job's necessary. Amen. You got to work. The Bible says if a man does not provide for his household, he's worse than an infidel. I encourage you to work. I encourage you to work hard. I encourage you to be faithful to your job. But some people, if they were as courteous and faithful to their job as they are to the house of God, they would be unemployed, and probably that's why some of them are unemployed. Oh, I get myself in trouble sometimes. We cannot have weekend warriors in Pentecost. We've got to be consumed with saving the lost. We've got to, when, when reaching the lost consumes you, it'll cause you to stay awake at night. 
Amen. It'll cause you to get up and pray by yourself somewhere during the day or at nighttime. It will consume you. You'll see the people in the store and you'll see tears. You'll feel tears starting rolling down your cheek because of the compassion and the the burden that you have for souls. How long has it been since we felt compassion for the lost? Amen. Revival will not come to the flash in the pan or the fly by night preachers. You can have a crowd and not have a church. The Bible says that they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The Bible says if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. Amen. The prophet said when Zion Zion travails. Sons and daughters will be born into the kingdom of God. Are you hearing the word today? I want to be so consumed with the church. I want to be so consumed with the lost that it troubles my spirit when I can't reach somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing that's necessary is we need to be more concerned about prayer condition than being air conditioned. Can I talk to you this morning? It's not a great mystery, but prayer is the key to the throne room of heaven. Prayer, the reason people have attitudes is because they're not praying. Oh, it got quiet. I have found in my own life when I have copped an attitude, it's because my prayer life has slacked off. Preacher didn't pray. Hallelujah. Things will get a hold of you when you're not praying. Come on, I'm, you know I'm preaching to you. It is a repellent for all attitudes. Prayer is the supernatural conversation between man and the God he serves. I find out today we preach about prayer, we teach about prayer, we talk about prayer, we read stories about prayer. Matter of fact, I believe and I'm convinced we probably know more about the subject of prayer than any other subject in the Bible, but we don't pray. Oh, yeah, I heard one preacher say it this way. He said, until we realize that not praying is sin, we will continue not to pray. Well, hallelujah. If you, get a car, if you have a concert, you can get a crowd. If you have a dinner, you can get a crowd. But if you have a prayer meeting, you just have the faithful few. You've heard the story before. I've used it on occasions that I had a gentleman years ago in the church kept coming to me, Pastor, we need to have revival. We need to have about every service. He'd come, Brother Hopkins, we need to have revival. Pastor, we need to have a revival. Hallelujah. We're going to have revival. Hallelujah. And, and I don't want to sound too carnal, but I believe the Bible says that the, the worker is worthy of his hire. He, man, at that point in time, we didn't have money to have a revival. If I can just be honest with you. But every service, got to have revival, got to have revival, got to have revival. So in prayer one time, the Lord says, let's have revival. So I get up and I announce, saints of God, we're going to have revival. And you should have seen his chin drop when I said, we're going to have a prayer revival. We're going to meet here on these nights and every night we're going to just pray and seek God. Hallelujah. He showed up, but never since had he ever asked me for revival. Hallelujah. He's already gone to his reward, so he's not here to hear what I'm saying. Hallelujah. But I'd, I'd say it anyway. He quit asking for revival. Hallelujah. You can get a crowd. You can have a crowd and not have revival. There's a direct correlation between miracles and prayer. It was prayer that brought the miracle ministry to the church. <clears throat> The apostles didn't have to go looking for the halt. They didn't have to go looking for the blind. They didn't have to go looking for those that were lame. Those that were sick came to them. Church, may I tell you today, when the word gets out that people are receiving healings in the name of Jesus Christ at Calvary Apostolic Church, we don't have to go out and announce it 
people are going to start coming because they are tired of being sick. They're sick and tired of being sick. Amen. The apostles didn't have to go out and look for them. They came. A praying church is a revival church. A church that comes anticipating a move of God in the service, whether it's a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. If we come anticipating a move of God, we will feel and we will see a move of God in our services. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me quickly go to the last material or ingredient that we need. We need to have a genuine sense of compassion. What was the magnet that Jesus had that drew the crowd? It was compassion. We got to be a church of compassion. The Bible says they understood that he would have compassion on them. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Hello? We got to have compassion on the lost. In a revival church, there is no big eyes and little use. There's no, I've been in church 152 years and you're just a babe in Christ. I'm better than you are. Amen. There's nothing like that in a revival church. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. I am nothing but Brother Hurley at our business meeting yesterday said his daddy always told him, he says, you're nothing more than a mud pie with a necktie. Hallelujah. We are all sinners saved by grace. We can never forget that we were formed from the dust of the ground. And when we graduate from this life, we will go back to the dust. The call of the scripture today is let brotherly love continue. Amen. The call of the scripture says how can you say that you love God and if you don't love your brother? If you can't sit with your brother or your sister down here, here, you will not live with them over there. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to close. Sister Carter, come. One of the successful things about ministering is the wisdom to know when it's time to shut up. Hallelujah. As we stand across the building. I believe that when we get the material list together, and start driving nails, we will have revival. But as some of you ladies know, as far as cooking, it only takes one missing ingredient to ruin the cake. It only takes one missing ingredient to ruin the chili. It only takes one missing bolt that hinders you from completing the project. We have focused for a long time on buildings. We have focused on administration. We have focused on training. We have focused on music. We have focused on all these minor things. Hallelujah. They're necessary, but they're not, they're not major things. While we're focusing on these things, another sinner has just exited into eternity. Heard a story of a home missionary one time. Went into a city to start a church. <clears throat> and he said, the first place I visited was the local cemetery. And he said, I walked up to the newest grave. Grass had not even started growing again. And he said, I stood there weeping, asking him to forgive me for not coming sooner. That's revival praying. Are you hearing me this morning? That's revival praying. Say you not, there are four months, then comes the harvest. We've majored in the minor for too long. God has given us everything that we need except for one thing. Hallelujah. And, and that, well, that one thing is running out, running out on us, and that's time. I don't know about you, but I want the smell of fish in the house. I drive by restaurants sometimes, and I smell fish, and I think, 
That smells nasty. <laughs> Some of y'all fish eaters, my extent of eating fish is Long John Silver's. It's probably because of the batter dip that they put on it. But I don't want to smell like fish. I don't want to smell like catfish or bass or crappie or bluegill. I want to smell like souls. I want to have the aroma in this building. Amen. I want to have the revival aroma. An an alabaster box that's being broken because of somebody that is hurting that's coming to the Lord. Amen. I believe that anointment can fill the room this morning. I feel a heaviness that's settling upon the church today. I feel that God is speaking to our hearts that He wants to use us. He wants to have revival church. Amen. It is His desire to save the lost. It is His desire desire for us to reach the lost of this community. I know we're having revival this weekend, but we don't have to wait for this weekend revival. Spirit can start. I'd like for the Holy Ghost to get a hold of us from here to back there. Amen. I want God to grip our hearts and that we begin to pray revival praying. We pray too much for what we need and not enough for the souls of humanity. Hallelujah. I could go on. I promise you I could. But I promise you if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of the other things that we've been praying for will be added to us. If you're not getting answers to prayers that you have on your list, start praying, revival praying, and see what God's going to do for you. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands and love the Lord? Come on, let's pray. Let's talk to God. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Ha ha ta